us worship God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord be with you and also with you. This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. A warm thank you for joining this morning's very special service. Welcome to Southerminster, especially if you've not been here before. At the moment, of course, we are not able to gather for public worship, but we hope that in a few weeks' time we will be able to do so and once again enjoy people coming into this fabulous building, the Cathedral Church for our diocese and county and city. This service is part of our annual celebration in June, celebration of the official birthday of Her Majesty the Queen. It comes together as we work with the Lord Lieutenant of Nottinghamshire, Sir John Peace, and the High Sheriff uh, for the particular year. And as we planned with Dame Elizabeth Frad earlier this year for this service, one of the themes that she wanted to bring out was given her distinguished and long career in nursing, she wanted us to celebrate the International Year of the Nurse and Midwife. We could not have seen then how significant this anniversary year would be because of the way the pandemic has impacted on all our lives and inevitably has brought to the forefront those in healthcare, uh, nursing and midwifery and other professions who have shown such remarkable work in recent weeks and months. Today we will hear from those who have been at the front line delivering uh, care, enabling others to endure what has been an extraordinarily testing and painful time for our nation and for all the countries of the world. You will hear from them. They will be modest in their contributions, but all have contributed with remarkable courage, self-sacrifice and compassion. Indeed, the very virtues shown in the life of Her Majesty the Queen, rooted in the Queen's deep Christian faith. And so as we join together for this service, wherever you are, across our county or further afield, I welcome you and ask you to participate as we pray for the work of those engaged in serving others and as we give thanks once again for Her Majesty the Queen and her remarkable leadership which has so influenced so many people across the world in recent weeks. And my thanks to everyone who is taking part in this service. So I now come to the formal words uh, of introduction. On this Sunday each year we come to our Cathedral Church to rejoice on the occasion of the official birthday of our Sovereign Lady Queen Elizabeth, to give thanks for her long life of service and her continuing commitment to peoples of all ages, races and cultures around the world. This year we gather in a different way, online, we do so, of course, because of the pandemic which continues to affect our world. This crisis has been a cause of unprecedented disruption to every aspect of our civic, working, social and worshipping lives. It has also been the occasion, as the Queen herself has remarked, of a remarkable coming together of neighbourhoods supporting one another, and especially their most vulnerable members, of health and care workers and other key workers, showing extraordinary levels of commitment in serving their local communities 
and of those communities gathering each Thursday to show their support in turn for those keeping us safe. We have also been made aware in recent weeks that there are still things that divide us, still injustices in need of healing. And yet today, we give thanks for all the good that we see around us and to pray for the coming of that time when our common life will be fully restored and when a new unity fostered during these extraordinary times will take root and grow to fullness among us. As we come to worship Almighty God, let us confess our sins and failures and shortcomings with confidence in God's love and faithfulness. I invite you to join with me and say, Most merciful God, we, your people, confess to you before the whole company of heaven and one another that we have sinned in thought, word and deed and in what we have failed to do. We have not always carried one another's burdens. We have not always cared for the vulnerable and those in need. Forgive us our sins, heal us by your Spirit, and raise us to new life in Christ. Amen. The Almighty and merciful Lord, grant you pardon and forgiveness of all your sins, time for amendment of life, and the grace and comfort of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, the fountain of all goodness, bless our sovereign lady, Queen Elizabeth, and all who are in authority under her, that they may order all things in wisdom and equity, righteousness and peace, to the honour and glory of your name, and the good of your church and people, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. My name is Charmaine Buss and I am a specialist nurse working in critical care at Nottingham University Hospitals. My role is to support our critically ill patients and their family and friends and also our staff. I have been a nurse for 17 years and I feel privileged to do the work that I do as part of an amazing team. During this COVID-19 pandemic, we have had to change the way we work and this has been exceptionally challenging at times. We had to prepare the hospital for unprecedented numbers of patients and there was a lot of uncertainty about what we would and will continue to face. A large part of my role during this time has been supporting our staff as we have all been affected by COVID-19 both personally and professionally. For most of us this pandemic will be the most challenging of our careers. I have been humbled by the personal sacrifices of my colleagues Staff have been living away from home to keep their family safe and many have returned to practice or work in areas that they haven't done before or for a very long time in order to help their colleagues and our patients. In the International Year of the Nurse and Midwife, we have come together as a team alongside all the staff in the hospital, which includes all the clinical and non-clinical staff. We have helped to look after our patients, their loved ones and each other. I am proud to be part of this phenomenal team. Critical care is a specialist area within our hospitals and we care for patients who are exceptionally unwell and when they are at their most vulnerable. Being unwell or having a loved one in hospital is always hard, but at the moment when people are unable to be together, this has been very distressing. My role has involved talking to relatives over the phone to offer help and support through these difficult times. We are working in new ways trying to bring people together when they cannot be physically here. 
we have set up ways for people to send messages to their loved ones and use video calling instead of visiting. I am amazed at the resilience and strength our patients have shown when fighting and overcoming their illness. My thoughts are with those whose lives were sadly lost and for their family and friends that are grieving for their loved one, especially for those who are unable to be together at this time. The support and recognition that we have received from the wider community and services through messages and donations has been overwhelming. I would like to thank everyone for all that they have done for us during this time. At Nottingham University Hospitals, we will continue to be here for our patients and their loved ones, and we will get through this together. Thank you for giving us an opportunity to be part of the celebrations today and for being able to share some of our experiences uh, from the Nightingale Hospital deliveries. Uh, my name is Major Matt Fry and I was supporting the North West region for the Nightingale Hospital in Manchester. And I'm Major Ben Foster and I was supporting the Nightingale Yorkshire number in the Harrogate Convention Centre. I think the first thing to say about the whole project really is the tremendous amount of vision that was required by everybody involved um, to get to grips with what we were being asked to do. And I don't think either of us really understood what that was when we rolled out the door and certainly my brief was to go to the northeast region of England and look for large venues where we could build intensive care hospital facilities. What that materialised in for me was a 500 bed intensive care facility in the Harrogate Convention Centre. And the model that was being uh, worked to in Manchester was different. Every Nightingale was unique with their own pressures, their own challenges and all of them had to be delivered at pace um, with uncertainty and conflicting information. I think this is where the military support really came into its own. It's the most uh, valuable asset that we were able to, to provide support with. On operations, we always deal in uncertainty. We have to make decisions as a balance of risk. And it was, it was great to be able to uh, see the NHS teams grow and, and grasp this as a concept. And I think what really helped was the fact that we were all galvanised around this common goal. Uh, and we really did think that we were in a race against time before we had people dying on the doorsteps of these facilities. So, so really that, that flows nicely into the courage that was dis displayed by the people involved. And all of those contractors who, who helped build the facilities, they were commuting uh, home every day and then back to the facility, being surrounded by hundreds of other contractors at a time where nobody really fully understood the risk. We had the leadership who were having to take uh, decisions uh, and, and manage risks. Uh, and then I think for both of us, as we, as we grew to understand what these facilities would become and how they operated, um, we came to realise just how much courage was required by the staff who would eventually uh, work in, the, in, in both facilities. Yeah. And it was incredibly stressful as well for all of the people involved in the delivery of those hospitals and right the way through from recruitment and training, the people that are going to staff and manage them. Um, and that takes its toll both physically and mentally and that demands a certain amount of resilience. And in fact, that's the nature of the whole Nightingale project. It was to build resilience for the nation and for the NHS. And I think for many, that resilience would be underpinned by the families that they left at home while they, they went off to do this work. Uh, so I suppose what that meant was this was just this huge team effort where you had uh, the NHS, a myriad of contractors, the support of the army and then the families back at home, uh, none of whom knew, had, had knew how to work with each other, It was we didn't know what to expect, but we all just came together and, uh, and, and worked towards this common goal. And seeing those teams come together and just being a small part of that has been by far for both of us the most rewarding part of our careers to date and it's been an honour to have been part of that um, and to be able to share some of those experiences with you today. Thank you. These extracts are from the Queen's broadcast to United Kingdom and Commonwealth on 5th of April 2020 as we enter the third week of lockdown. I want to thank everyone on the NHS frontline as well as care workers and those carrying out essential roles who selflessly continue their day-to-day -day duties as out of their homes in support of us all. I am sure the nation will join me in assuring you that what you do 
is appreciated and every hour of your hard work brings us closer to a return to more normal times. Together we are tackling this disease and I want to reassure that if we remain united and resolute then we will overcome it. These moments when the United Kingdom has come together to applaud its care and essential workers will be remembered as an expression of our national spirit and its symbol will be the rainbows drawn by our children. Across the Commonwealth and around the world we have seen heartwarming stories of people coming together to help others but through be it through delivering food parcels, medicine, checking on neighbours or converting businesses to help the relief effort. While we have faced challenges before, this one is different. This time we have we join all nations across the globe in a common endeavour, using the great advances of science and our instinctive compassion to heal. We will succeed, and that success will belong to every one of us. We should take the comfort that while we may have more still to endure, better days will return. We'll be with our friends again, we'll be with family again, we will meet again. This lockdown has been a hard time for all of us and has given us a great opportunity to come together and help those in need. It has given me a great opportunity to help my grandma and ensure she stays safe. People will never forget and appreciate the helping hand that has helped them in tough times like this. The poem I'm about to read suggests the notion of a recalibration or, as Prince Charles has said, the Great Reset that will take place as life resumes some sense of normality following the peak of the pandemic. For many, and that includes me, the future feels very uncertain, but the simple beauty of the poem helps me to feel that all things are possible. It was written by Catherine O'Meara in March this year and has been chaired hundreds of times on social media and many other outlets. I suspect that this is because so many of us are seeking the silver lining that we hope would emerge from the pandemic that has placed us together apart. And people stayed at home and read books and listened and rested and made art and played and learned new ways of being and was still and listened more deeply. Someone meditated, someone prayed, someone danced, and someone met their own shadow. And people started to think differently, and people healed. And in the absence of people who lived in ignorant ways, dangerous, mindless and heartless, the earth began to heal. And when danger ended and people found themselves and they grieved for the dead and they made new choices and dreamed of new visions and created new ways to live and heal the earth fully, just as they had been.
book of Ruth. Naomi said, See, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, Do not press me to leave you or to turn back from following you. Where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die. There will I be buried. May the Lord do thus and so to me, and more as well, if even death parts me from you. When Naomi saw that she was determined to go with her, she said no more to her. So the two of them went on until they came to Bethlehem. When they came to Bethlehem, the whole town was stirred because of them. And the women said, Is this Naomi? She said to them, Call me no longer Naomi, call me Mara. For the Almighty has dealt bitterly with me. I went away full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi? And the Lord has dealt harshly with me, and the Almighty has brought calamity upon me. So Naomi returned together with Ruth, the Moabite, a daughter-in-law, who came back with her from the country of Moab. They came to Bethlehem at the beginning of the barley harvest. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We all need to hear stories of transformation living through a time like this. Stories that display the power there is in acts of kindness with courage. There have been plenty in the news these past 12 weeks. Captain Tom is in good company. It may have been something more personal for you. A family member working on the front line in the NHS a friend on the checkout in a supermarket, a relative in a care home, or a teacher in one of the school hubs for the children of key workers. I would encourage you to capture those stories while they're still fresh in your memory. Write them down, or maybe there are some favourite images or photographs. Try to reflect on some of the thoughts and feelings that may have raced through your mind and as those events unfolded. It's not simply good therapy. It could open up a rich seam of wisdom on life or a doorway to rediscovering what things truly matter in this world. Well, for the same reason, I want also this morning to warmly commend to you that you might read the book of Ruth, tucked away in the first third of the Bible. The story has it all, kindness, courage, friendship, and hope. And what makes this book so accessible is that all the heroic figures in the book of Ruth are very ordinary people. There are no battles for valiant soldiers to fight, no kings defending their throne, no politicians vying for power, no super talented people uh, breaking records. Yet the book of Ruth is a masterclass in how to display courageous kindness. All the main characters excel in this, and not because life has treated them particularly well and, and they can afford to be generous. They have known desperate times and they've experienced unbearable loss. Now, if you've not read this story before, I'll try not to spoil it for, for you. The verses Sir John read from chapter 1 describe the main character, Naomi, at the very lowest moment in her life. She's returning to her hometown after 10 years in a foreign land where her husband and both her sons have died. Now, in the culture of the time, Naomi has no choice but to return to her homeland, a destitute widow, completely broken by life. Her sons had married foreign women who, by custom and in law, have no responsibility for Naomi. And yet they display great kindness in deciding that they will leave the safety 
of their extended families and go with her into a perilous future. On the journey, Naomi realizes they are sacrificing everything for her, that there is very little hope of them ever finding husbands in Israel. After all, they were Moabites. They were enemies of Israel at that time. So she pleads for them to return to their families. One of them finally accepts that it's the sensible thing to do. The other refuses to turn back. Her name is Ruth. Ruth now speaks for the very first time in this story and her words are among the most moving in scripture. Not just for their poetic beauty, but her extraordinary courage and kindness. Don't urge me to leave you, she tells Naomi, or turn back from you. Where you go, I will go. And where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die and there I will be buried. With radical self-sacrifice, Ruth abandons every base of security that any person, let alone a poor widow in that context, would have clung to. Her native homeland, her own people, even to her own gods. And Ruth abandons it all to stay by Naomi's side and to take refuge in Naomi's God. In one sense, it doesn't change anything. Naomi is still penniless, returning home with a bitterness so deep that people barely recognise her. Yet, on another level, from this moment on, everything changes. Ruth's courageous kindness seems to set off a, a chain of events that result in more acts of kindness and in God's blessing flowing through it all. In the closing episode of the story, Naomi is no longer broken and bitter. She has now found hope. Hope above all in the form of a grandson that she now cradles on her knees. This is the child born to Ruth after her marriage to Boaz, a local farmer whose own kindness sets him apart. And notice this in particular, he publicly stands against the racial slur cast on Ruth and gives her life dignity in the eyes of others. And God, again, is at work through it all, weaving these things into his eternal purposes. Today's service, with its special focus on celebrating the NHS and, in particular, the nursing profession, points us to the lives of countless thousands across this county who, over the years, have served with steady resolve and steadfast kindness, caring for the sick and the dying, including Nottinghamshire's own Ethel Bedford Fenwick. Once again, these past weeks, our nation has recognised the values these people exemplify it is not simply their professionalism and fine training that makes them stand out, but the inspiration of their courage and their kindness. Like Ruth, they have been bright shafts of light <clears throat> breaking through the darkness of this time. In another story of courage overcoming the darkness, Tolkien uh, puts these words on Gandalf's lips. Some believe it is only great power that can hold evil in check. But that is not what I have found. It is the small everyday deeds of ordinary folk that keep the darkness at bay. Small acts of kindness and love. None of us can know what difference our kindness may mean to someone else and what good it may bring about. The book of Ruth reminds us that we can leave the outcome with God. For Ruth and Naomi, God's purpose was far grander than anything they could have imagined. There is a clue to this tucked away in part of the story read this morning. The narrator tells us that Naomi arrives home to a place called Bethlehem, just as the barley harvest was beginning. The grandchild on her knees at the close 
will be great-grandfather to King David, who himself receives from God the promise that one of his descendants will reign forever. This is Jesus, the one who put on a never-to-be-forgotten masterclass of courage, kindness and self-sacrifice to fill empty people with hope all across the world. Ruth could not have known that her kindness would one day lead all the way to the cross. Now, today, living in a time that's marked by tension and fear, with deep uncertainty about the future for jobs and for our economy and in education, each one of us can play our part in a story that we can be proud to tell our grandchildren and to be told to their grandchildren. Our small, everyday acts of kindness, by the grace and power of God, can continue to hold evil in check and to be a sign of hope in our broken world. But like Ruth and Naomi, we can start by crying out to God, above all for his help, for his protection, and for his inspiration now and in the days to come. And so I close with words from Psalm 62. Trust in him at all times, you people. Pour out your hearts to him. For God is our refuge. Amen. a local specialist charity working to reduce the impact of domestic abuse, sexual violence and gender inequality. Um, COVID-19 restrictions have had a huge impact on abuse and on survivors. Uh, many have been isolated for prolonged periods of time with their abuser with incredibly limited means of reaching out for support and with far fewer, if any, protective factors in place. Um, survivors have reported levels of domestic abuse escalating, um, with abusive, abusers having far more control over their lives. Um, three quarters have said that COVID has made it harder for them to leave. And devastatingly, in three weeks in March, female domestic homicides rose to the highest level ever of five women per week being killed. Equation have provided vital services during this time. Um, we have increased our campaigning via social media uh, and online to let survivors know that help is available. Um, it is possible to leave. There are silent support solutions uh, available to them and COVID restrictions are not more important than their safety. We've identified key spaces where we can still physically reach survivors um, and encourage them to ask for support. For example, we've ensured that all local pharmacies across the city and county have survivor information cards, can recognise indicators of abuse uh, and can signpost to specialist support. 
Um, all of our training has moved online and we've been targeting key frontline staff that may still have contact with survivors. Um, as an example, we have trained all Golden uh, number volunteers in the city. Um, working alongside our women's aid colleagues, we've ensured seamless support to survivors. Um, and our men's service have made sure that there are silent solutions available and a helpline available for men experiencing domestic abuse. Our biggest concern though is for our children and young people. Hugely disadvantaged, uh, often without the means to ask for help and without their safe space of school each day. Equation have continued to work uh, with schools to train staff and to provide resources uh, to work with those experiencing domestic abuse. But our biggest focus right now is for when our young people get back to school. Um, we need to book as many of our projects in as many schools across the city and county so that when they return, children can recognise abuse, can speak out and can access specialist support. Equation are committed to creating a world without domestic abuse, sexual violence and gender inequality, but we can't do this on our own. Um, everybody has a part to play and I would encourage you to visit our website, read our, our blogs, our, our COVID-19 specific blogs, Follow us on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram and repost those key messages to reach more survivors. Carry our survivor resources, so should you know someone experiencing abuse, you can give them the right information. Book our projects in your local schools and where possible uh, to support us with a one-off or regular donation. With this simple support, we can increase the number of children we reach, the number of survivors getting support and the number of workers we train. Thank you. Let us pray. God, our Heavenly Father, on this day on which we celebrate the official birthday of our Sovereign Lady, Queen Elizabeth, we give thanks for her lifelong example of service and faith. And we pray for your continued blessing on her and on the whole royal family that amid the changes and challenges of this present year, they may continue to be a focus for our nation's unity and renewal. We pray too for all the Queen's representatives, especially for Dame Elizabeth, our High Sheriff, for all the groups and causes represented in our service today. In this, the International Year of the Nurse and Midwife, we thank you for the dedication and professionalism of nurses and midwives and of every one of our health and care workers whose skills have tended, healed and reassured us during this time of crisis. Give them strength, courage and endurance and surround them with your protection as they put themselves in harm's way each day in serving us. We pray for our communities in which we have witnessed so many acts of kindness and solidarity over these past weeks and where many more such acts have happened in secret, unseen except by you, our Heavenly Father who sees in secret. Bless all those who have supported and continue to support our cities, towns and villages in countless ways, great and small, and among them our emergency services and armed forces. Be with all those who are working for the good of others this day. We pray finally for the vulnerable, the suffering, and those at risk. We pray for victims of domestic abuse and sexual violence, and for the work of equation in our county, needed now more than ever. We continue to pray for those affected by COVID-19, for the sick, the shielding, those whose livelihoods are in danger or whose mental health is precarious. We pray for those who mourn.
And now we bring together all our prayers in the words that Jesus himself taught us, the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. God grant to the living grace, to the departed rest, to the church, the queen and the commonwealth and all people peace and concord, and to all us, his servants, life everlasting, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit come down upon you and remain with you always. Amen.